thousands, even yourself, to the submission to the one true God. And we spoke about in the last episode that how the Jews and the Christians had different concepts of who Allah is. And now we're going to look at even in Hinduism, the way that they associate God in being a good luck charm, as being a deity that somehow they can associate partners with, is something that is very, very dangerous. So it's not only Christianity and Judaism that we see had a wrong interpretation, but many other religions as well. And so we find that a number of religions in the world, like if your son or your daughter is sick, you take him to the guru, or you take him to the ashram, and they will tie a cord around his hand, or they'll tell you to go tie a cord around the tree, and they'll tell you to make some sacrifices of fruit or whatever it might be, and that will help you with prosperity. These are the things that are associating partners with Allah. You know when somebody says, I went to this priest at this church. You know the Pentecostal charismatic churches, you know the jumping around, jumping around, praise the Lord, hallelujah, all those ones. The, I call it the name it, claim it, and frame it churches. You can say to God, I want a BMW, and you can claim it because you've just demanded you're going to get it, and you're going to get it. This is what the prosperity churches tell you today. They say, I call them name it, claim it, and frame it churches. And so they will say, you must go to this church because there's a priest there. He will pray for you and he will heal you. He will heal you. You've associated a partner with Allah by even saying that. So today we have these priests and charlatans running around who think that they are representatives of God on earth, that they are associating themselves as gods. We had, in my country, there's a religion called the Shemba religion. And in the Shemba religion, there was this man who believed he was God. And all the African community in my country believed he was a God. And so to prove he was a God, he jumped off a mountain. Guess what? He wasn't a God. He died. That was the end of Shemba. And so the religion took a big bash. But lo and behold, his son came along about 10 years later and said, I am my father, I am risen again. And all the people went, oh, okay, no problem, we all believe that. And so he became Shemba number two. And he died, and now God's dead again. So maybe it's going to be his nephew or somebody else that's going to come up and start all over again. But this is the state of affairs. Many people have very strange things. In India, we have guru on every corner. I was driving in a taxi the other day, and there was this sticker with this new man who was written in... in a, Hindi or something, I don't know what language it was written in, but the, one of the drivers was translating to me and said, no, he's the new God. And I said, what? He's like a white guy, looks like a white guy. I don't know if you've seen him, guru style. And it says, no, this man is the new God. It said, God has no shape or form, yet in this man he has a shape and form. Some of you know what this guy is. He's a new guy that's around, and he says, it actually says, almost like we believe in Islam, God has no shape and form. Then it has the picture of the man, and underneath it it says, except in this man. Huh. Did we have that type of thinking in the world? So this is why in Islam it's so simple. Does it mean that God could not? Of course he could. Of course he could. Why would he? That's the question. The question is not could he. The question is why would he? You see, we've described this before. Imagine you're a, maybe a carpenter. And it's your job to make the most beautiful furniture, this beautiful table. And you know exactly how to use those tools. In Malawi, which is a part of Africa, they have the greatest craftsmen I've ever seen anywhere in the world. They take a solid piece of wood and they'll make a table out of a solid piece, no joins. And they carve in a hammer with one tool and one hammer, one mullet. And they make the beautiful carvings of elephants and everything on the side, on the top of the table, all a solid piece of wood. But if you ask that man, did you ever dream of becoming a piece of wood? He'll look at you like, are you mad? He'll think you're crazy. He said, did you ever dream to become a tree so that you could know how to do carpentry like you're doing? He'll go, you guys are crazy where you come from. He doesn't dream of ever doing that, becoming a piece of wood, becoming a tree. In fact, he can knock on a tree before he even cuts it down and go, this is no good, this is perfect. And that tree he'll cut down and he'll make this beautiful, fashionable piece of furniture. He never dreamed of becoming a part of his creation when he made that. Same with the doctor when he comes to you go to the doctor's room and he pricks your finger and he puts it on a slide and he takes that slide and he puts it under the microscope or he sends it to the lab to be tested and that vial comes into the lab and they put it in the spinning machine, whatever it's called, centrifuge, whatever it's called, the thing that spins around. And then they'll be able to test the blood. 
That, that technician in the lab who's clicking these things and moving their samples around never once goes, oh, I wish I could become blood so I could understand what goes on in blood. He simply goes, I understand because I can look from the outside. I have studied, I know, I know everything there is to know about blood without having to become blood to understand it. Allah is far more important than that carpenter, far more important than that doctor, far more important than that lab technician. Why would he want to become part of his creation? There's no logic in it. There's no sense in it. So that he could understand the suffering of humanity. He understands everything about humanity. He created humanity that we have, everything there is to us. He doesn't need to understand anything. You need to understand him. It's the wrong way around. We've got the whole thing inverted the wrong way around. We need to try to understand Allah, not him try to understand us. He knows everything about us. It says that nothing happens to us without his consent. The Christians agree with this. The Jews agree with this. Yet somehow they believe that God would have to become part of his creation to understand his creation. Allah needs to just say you are forgiven and you are forgiven. He doesn't need to punish himself. Why would he whip and beat and crucify himself to punish himself so that he could understand you? So that he could say you are forgiven. All he simply needed to do was say you are forgiven. And many people will say well he's bound by the rules of the Old Testament where it says I change not and I do not be swayed from left to right as the Old Testament says. Well, if that's true, you've got big problems. Because you have a look throughout the Bible, he changes his mind all the time in the Bible. One minute he says you are cursed, the next minute he says you're not cursed. The one minute he says you're forgiven, the next minute he says you're not forgiven. He makes countless numbers of covenants with the people of Israel, changing the rules of how to have your sins forgiven. We call it dispensationalism. So if this is true, then why couldn't he have changed the rules when it came to forgiving mankind? So there's no consistency in the argument. The argument fails on every level. So the Hindu concept of having this good luck is also shirk, is also associating partners with God. When we are relying on Allah, we believe Allah is the most merciful, that He even helps any diseases or sicknesses that happen. He is the cure, not the person who's doing it. And be careful, Muslims, be careful. There are charlatans amongst the Muslim community trying to sell you brooches, and magic charms and things that you tie around yourself and coming to you and say, well, if you pay me $20 or $100, then I will give you this special thing that will help you have cures. That has got nothing to do with it. If you're putting faith in something that somebody sold you, then you are associating partners with Allah. There is no other way around. Because you're putting faith in that object and you're saying that object is going to heal me. You are putting something in front of Allah. You need to remove all obstacles that prevent you from following Tawheed. Anything that you put in front of your relationship with Allah will be removed. If that is the light shining on my hand and I put something in front of it, what happens? There's shade here and you're in darkness again. You're no longer in light. And that's how you know if you're following Tawheed or not. Anything that you put in front of you that takes away the light of Allah, you are know you are now in error. So be very, very cautious. There are many people out there, unfortunately, in the world that are pulling the wool over the Muslims' eyes, and some of it's coming from within. Remember, we spoke about not only do we have the attack on Islam from outside, we have the attack from Islam on the inside. And now we are not saying that there is only one right group within Islam. That right group might be wrong too. But the right group is that group that makes the Quran and the Hadith the thing that they follow that makes Tawheed the thing that they hold on to. That is what is rooted in their lives. So we as Muslims have to make very, very sure that what we are following is truth. That we're not listening to some interpretation of somebody. There are many, many people that are leading our Muslim brothers astray. And much of that is happening within the Muslim community itself. We can't blame the Jews. We can't blame the Christians. Sometimes we find it happening ourselves, and that's because we are not rightly guided. This is why we have to submit to Allah. This is why we have to ask Allah. Every year we have the opportunity for 30 days to do internal investigation. 30 days we have a chance to open ourselves up and to look for foreign bodies that shouldn't be inside our own lives, and to take those things and discard them, so that after Ramadan, we're able to stand up and walk for the next 11 months in the right tawheed, in the right way as Muslims.
What we have to do as Muslims, we need to have a break. When we get back from the break, we'll continue, inshallah. The ambassadors of peace from different parts of the world who dedicated their lives to convey the message of peace came together at the grand 10-day peace conference in Mumbai with one vision, with one mission. Hundreds of thousands of people witnessed them, heard them. Now it's an opportunity for those who miss the live action. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Watch them again in Peace Mission next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and bismillah rahman rahim. We are continuing with our look at Dawah ilallah. It's the Dawah of Tawheed that will unite us all. And we as Muslims must understand that if we teach this to the people that we are talking to, that they will understand not to associate partners with Allah. And this will eventually protect us, guide us, and save us from disasters in our lives. Not only from the disasters of the hellfire, but other disasters as well. If we put Tawheed in the center of our life, it will save our finances. It will save the food that you're eating. It'll give barakah in every part of your life. If you put Allah as the central point, with everything else that comes off it will be right. If the Tawheed is wrong and you don't understand that part and you don't have the relationship with Allah right, everything else will fall apart. There will be no barakah in your money. Everything will collapse. So it has to be correct. People will say, but you keep going on and on and on about this. It's so important that we have to understand it. We have to explain it to you over and over again. And this is why we need to make sure that in your local communities, in your homes where you live, speak to a scholar in your area and say, please come and do lectures on Tawheed to us. Help us get the proper picture, the right understanding, so that you don't go into error. So let's continue. We're going to reach uh, chapter 4 of the Quran in Ayah 116. So our brother will be reading it to us now. Verily, Allah never forgives the action that someone be associated with him and forgives other than association. To whomsoever he likes. Surah Nisa, verse 116. So calling towards Allah means to call towards Islam. So when we call people to submission to Allah, we're at the same time calling them towards Islam. It's a package deal. Because we need to understand that the word Islam means, the word Islam means someone else has had a chance to speak. What does Islam mean? Submission to who? To Allah. So by default, when you're calling people to Allah, you're calling them to submit to Islam. You're calling them to submitting to Allah. So sometimes we try to separate these things. And we say, we're doing dawah to Allah, then we do dawah to Islam, and then we do... It's one package deal. It's connected together. It's an all or nothing package deal. So when you're calling towards Islam, you're actually calling people to submit to Allah anyway. But for definition purposes, we are calling this series dawah ilallah. Because when we say we're calling people to Islam, some people get the idea of religion, like an organized religion. Many people in the world that I speak to, the vast majority of the people say, I'm sick of organized religion. Go to your Gothic friends and your, those people who are into metal and punk. What will they tell you? You know that music scene. They say, we are sick of organized religion. They're right. I'm also sick of organized religion. I'll stand with the banner saying, end of organized religion. Because organized religion is why we are in the trouble we're in today in the world. Islam is not an organized religion as Catholicism and Presbyterians and Hinduism and Buddhism and all the other isms in the world are. It's an independent religion based on you and your relationship to Allah. Nobody knows what your relationship truly is except you. It's an individual relationship between you and Allah. There is an importance for you to work together with the rest of the Muslim Ummah. But we don't have a, a local church congregation that we go to. When you hear the call to pray, you go to the closest mosque. You go there. We don't have membership to the local mosque. There's no certificate that's given to you and says you are now a member of whatever mosque. There's no such thing in Islam. So we are on an individual walk independently of each other. 
On the day of judgment, what was your relationship to me? What was your understanding of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu What was your commitment to me? Not what organization you belong to. What I'm saying to you is that at the most important thing that we need to understand is that we have to understand that Tawheed is holding us together. And that these other things that we are doing are there to help us to come closer to Allah. If we put our priorities in the right place, if our priorities are done in the right way. And so we must be very, very careful that we are calling people to submit towards Allah. And by calling people to submit towards Allah, we'll become better people for those people to want to emulate us and to copy us. So we have to be very cautious of what we do. Now, calling towards Allah is a means to call people towards submission in Islam. So Islam is a religion, but the idea of religion has a connotation behind it of not thinking why you're doing something. And that's very important for us to understand. There's a blindness to the word religion. That you're just doing things out religiously. If you look at the term religion or read the word religion is defined, it's the acts that are done religiously. If you read the word religion as found in the dictionary or definition of the word religion, it talks about something that has been done ritualistically. In other words, not knowing what the rituals are for, just doing them. Where Islam, there are no rituals. We have things that we do, but they're not rituals. If you just get up there and go up, down, kiss the ground and into town and you think that's your salah done, it's worth nothing. You just did aerobics because it's not a ritual. If it becomes a ritual, then you need to rethink about what you're doing. There has to be thought behind every action. You know when I'm talking about the up, down, kiss the ground, into town? It's like, chip, 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 gone. Instead of taking your time, think about everything that you're doing. Concentrate. If you're in the military and your sergeant major comes and walks past you and you're standing there going, what's he going to do with you? He's going to smack you right off your feet. You'll land on the ground. You'll be dizzy for a few hours because you'll say, what is that supposed to be? You're supposed to be standing at attention. What is this? You know how people are? You have to be proud. You have to be rigid. Not out of fear, out of pride of who you're representing. You're supposed to be representing your government or your country, or whatever it is when you're in the military. You are in the military now of Allah. Not in the way the Americans are understanding, so don't get scared. But in the way of understanding what it actually is to have pride in your belief. Have pride in your religion. So when you're doing anything, think about what you're doing. Hold those positions in pride. Think of yourself and say, oh, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah. I'm doing this for pride of Allah, not for my pride, but I'm happy to be doing this. If you're doing it in a rush, quick, 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 get this over as fast as possible, rather just leave it out. It's not worth anything anyway. So do it properly. Everything that we do, do it properly. If you're going to fast, don't sit there like two hours before and go, ish, the sun better go down there. It's taking a long time. I wish I lived closer to the ocean. You know, you've seen those adverts that they've got, some of their countries, like in my country, they've got a burger joint. I won't say the name of the company, but they have this advert for a burger, and this guy's watching the sun coming down, he's got a burger, and he's holding it in his mouth. He's waiting for the sun to go down, and he's like dripping, his mouth is dripping because he wants to take a bite of this burger. I mean, that's the message sometimes we're giving. It's just like, get this over with. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Instead of enjoying what we are supposed to be doing, such a short period of time anyway. So think about everything that you're doing. When we are calling people towards Allah, we are also calling people at the same time to Islam as the belief system, as the way of living a better life. And so we are to convince people that they should be, convince people that they should be changing their life for the better. Convince people, not force people. So we are not trying to brainwash them. We are not trying to sit down and say, but you have to believe. No, you have to believe. You have to believe. You have to. You have to. Just leave it. Your job is to tell them. If they choose to accept that part or reject that part, it's up to them. Obviously, you don't just leave them on their own. You need to check back every few weeks. Like, there's many stories that, that have been narrated, even during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, even right through to this day, where people you know, say, I'll become a Muslim, but I want to still do the sin. And they were given and said, fine, you carry on doing that. But one thing, you have to be honest about it. So every time the people would go ask the person about the problem, he would tell them, I'm still doing it. I'm still doing it. And eventually they'd stop doing it because they felt embarrassed. So if you have somebody who perhaps is reverted to Islam or wants to revert to Islam and they're still doing something, leave it. Just check on them though still. Every now and then say, so 
how's that uh, smoking problem going? And they say, oh, and I'm still doing it. So, oh, okay, just checking. Every time you see them, you go, so how's that smoking problem? He's going to get sick of you asking. And eventually, he'll start thinking, maybe I should try. Maybe I should put the effort in. So you still check, but don't be a critic. I remember working with a Muslim recently, the last year or so. And every time they'd light up a cigarette, they'd go to hide away from me. So I said to them, don't hide from me. You can smoke in front of me. Why did I do that? So he'd feel worse. So if he goes away and smokes, what good is that? He must do it in front of me, so he feels bad about every drag. So that way he helps him to overcome it, for giving him courage. So we don't criticize what he's doing. We say, no, you can do it in front of me. But in the way, he feels more embarrassed then. So he can use wisdom in what we do. So this is the idea we strive to establish in the lives of people the life of Islam as it's supposed to be. The life that Allah would want in the lives of the human beings. So we want to establish Islam in people. We don't just want to call them to Islam, we want to establish, we want to build. We want to have the castle there, you know. If you want to establish rights to a country, it means you have to send an armed force in there, you have to send technicians in, you have to have builders, everything has to be done. Then you establish a stronghold there. Otherwise, you haven't established anything. You remember in the war, if you'll see some countries when they invade another country and they don't establish a base, next week it's been taken over and they're out again because they never establish a stronghold. So we have to make sure that when we call people to Islam, that we call them to submit to Allah when they come to Islam, then we establish Islam in their lives, inshallah. Help them towards the deen of Islam. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Make sure you join us again, same place, same time. So for me, Arig of Islam, and those in the audience here, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد
Truth is hidden, and misleading quotations create confusion. Where truth is hidden, lack of knowledge and wisdom cause upheaval and commotion. Where truth is hidden, manipulate scriptures and twisted facts emerge. This very hidden truth creates false propaganda, mayhem, chaos, disorder, and turmoil in our lives and the world order. But is there anyone with courage and wisdom? What is the truth? And who has the courage to expose it? Because it's your right to know the truth. Watch Truth Prevail and Lies Perish in Truth Exposed by Dr. Zakir Naik. Every Sunday to Friday at 9 p.m. UK and 10 p.m. Europe on Peace TV. The value of money in the hereafter will be measured by its proper use in the present. According to the glorious Quran, one of the best ways to use your money is to spend it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by spreading his message of Islam. Peace TV is a non-profit Islamic satellite television channel that is primarily dedicated for just that cause the proper presentation of Islam. It's a great choice to invest in it and a golden opportunity to purify your wealth in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Support Peace TV. Send your zakat and donations to IRFI Al Ryan Bank, 47 Calthorpe Road, Birmingham, UK. B151TH. Pound account number 0113230. IBAN GB49ARAY 3008301132301. Sort code 300083. Swift BIC code ARAY GB. B22. Please confirm your contribution at support at peacetv.tv. Support Peace Team, the solution for humanity. Uh...
for humanity.